Welcome to Micro, a podcast for short but powerful writing. I'm your host, Drew Hawkins. Sumac Trees, Toads, and Kate Bush's Hill. This is an episode on stories, memory, and place. Take a seat and take a literary break. Nothing but goodness here. 30 days worth of living, writing, process, and perchance are encapsulated in this first piece titled NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month, or The Part of the Novel. Written by Brian Allen Ellis, this piece was published in Hobart. Enjoy. Day one. The part of the novel where your character and their equally grief-stricken and famished cousin sit with your character's dying mother in a hospital room while eating chicken wings and watching an episode of Friends. The mother's beleaguered breathing and death rattles coexisting with the show's laugh track and the witty banter of its principal characters. Day 2. The part of the novel where your character takes hallucinogenic mushrooms at their friend's baby shower, perhaps while nursing grief, heartbreak, a dislocated shoulder, and a double well tequila and soda, with lime. Day 3. The part of the novel where your character dissociates at a weekly trivia night. Day 4. The part of the novel where your character can't sleep because they're too busy thinking about all the loss they've endured maybe counting the many damaged things in their life, the broken portions of themselves. Day 5. The part of the novel where your character's co-worker tells a story about his dad walking out on him and his family when he was 8, leaving a $10 bill stuffed into the seat of a wooden toy car and a Friday the 13th NES video game cartridge. Versus the part of the novel where your character's roommate, after getting lit off of seven Michelob Ultras, tells a story about the time he smoked a bowl on top of a mountain, with a chipmunk. Day 6. The part of the novel where your character momentarily runs out of wet food for their cat, and they tearfully apologize to the cat like she's a child whose needs have ultimately been neglected, and it's all very sad. Day 7. The part of the novel where your character has a head in their hands moment, perhaps trying to stifle the fear that putting effort into things that aren't worth it has somehow defined them. Day 8. The part of the novel where your character politely asks their depression if it might want to finally shower and maybe walk with them to the library, you know, as a treat. Versus the part of the novel where your character politely asks a window to switch its pain for their pain. Day 9. The part of the novel where your character receives a phone call from the mortuary informing them that their mother's cremation has been completed and that her ashes and death certificates are, like a Chinese takeout order, ready for pickup. Day 10, the part of the novel where your character goes to Applebee's to forget. Day 11, the part of the novel where the hill your character chooses to die on is the one Kate Bush was running up to make that deal with God. Day 12, the part of the novel where your character goes to different bars, and instead of going inside the different bars, they just stand outside talking to all the door people they know, which feels like a bunch of deleted scenes from Waking Life, but whatever. Day 13, the part of the novel where your character wakes up from a stressful dream about being at work and then immediately has to go to work. Versus, the part of the novel where your character dreams about singing along with a naked Dave Bautista to Culture Club's Karma Chameleon at a house party, which culminates in either a fist bump or a Bautista bomb through a coffee table. Versus, the part of the novel where your character dreams about tweeting, Star Wars doesn't deserve Adam Driver based solely on them having watched, in said dream, a new Star Wars movie where Kylo Ren is now a debauched rock star who drunkenly makes a fool of himself in front of an audience and then cries on stage. Versus the part of the novel where your character is shaken from this dream they had, where Henry Rollins is getting increasingly frustrated while showing them how to use a Fisher-Price turntable. Day 14. The part of the novel where your character attempts to escape the haunted house that's been built within themselves. Like it's a magic trick being performed by Chris Angel or David Blaine. Day 15. The part of the novel where your character philosophizes about how the Goonies opens with a presumably dead guy hanging in a jail cell, 
followed by a child getting body shamed, a penis being broken off of a mini David statue, and a Hispanic maid threatened to be tortured in a supposed hidden sex dungeon, all in the first 15 minutes. Day 16, the part of the novel where your character tries kicking a door in while You Gotta Be, the 1994 hit by Desiree, plays from behind the door. Versus, the part of the novel where your character's thing is to look flummoxed while asking, is this the Pussycat Dolls? Whenever entering a room where music is being played. Day 17, the part of the novel where your character asks, why are you like this? But to existence. Day 18, the part of the novel where your character purchases a bath bomb made into the likeness of their screaming, fearful face. Day 19, the part of the novel where your character wonders why TikTok which just seems like a social media platform for people who enjoy lip-syncing random dialogue in a cute and or sexy manner, isn't just called sync kink. Day 20. The part of the novel where your character approaches someone who also has a Yosemite Sam tattoo and is like, Yosemite Sam! Day 21. The part of the novel where your character's cat gets stolen. Day 22. The part of the novel where your character can't decide if their most cherished childhood memory was when their mother took them to the 1991 WWF Royal Rumble at the Miami Arena, age 9, or when they vomited grape soda all over the kitchen floor, age 5, while racing into the house to catch the premiere of Teen Wolf on HBO. Day 23. The part of the novel where your character can't believe someone actually thought Alabama was a sweet home and then wrote a song about it. Day 24, the part of the novel where your character offers a fist bump to a hermit crab and says, yo, I too reside in an empty shell of myself. Day 25, the part of the novel where your character attempts to make room in their busy schedule to reunite with old friends, maybe squeezing them in somewhere between the misery and terror. Versus the part of the novel where your character considers making new friends, since most of the ones they already have are either too broken or too fixed. Day 26. The part of the novel where your character gets a booster vaccination shot because they can't say no to free drugs of any kind. Day 27. The part of the novel where your character contemplates whether they actually believe in a thing called love and if the rhythm of their heart is even worth listening to. Day 28. The part of the novel where your character walks in on their roommate intensely watching a Rugrats in Paris video game playthrough on a UHD smart TV. Versus the part of the novel where your character realizes their roommate has been spending hours watching a channel that just shows footage of a train traveling through Norway. Day 29. The part of the novel where your character finally realizes that existence is the awful apartment they pay too much for, society is the shitty roommates they're forced to share it with, and death is their final eviction notice. Day 30. The part of the novel where your character gets their stolen cat back. Brian Allen Ellis runs House of Vlad Press and is the author of several books, including Sad Laughter and Hobbies You Enjoy, which is serialized daily on Instagram at Hobbies You Enjoy. You can find him on Twitter at Brian Allen Ellis, on Instagram at Depressed Writer Asshole, or on his website at neutralspaces.co slash Brian Allen Ellis. Our second piece just so happens to come from the founder of NaNoWriMo, Grant Faulkner. While not explicitly about writing, this brief piece does touch on stories. Published in Green Mountain's review, it's called The Toad. Enjoy. Flattened by a car, its arms spread out, a little like Jesus. The sun had baked it as crisp as a potato chip. Poor Toad, Maria said, didn't know how to cross the road. Maybe he thought the car was a new friend, I said, rushing to greet him. Or he was puzzling how such a small thing in the distance could become so large, she said. We spent hours in such conversations. It was nice how we never talked about what was next, who we were together. As if the Toad wasn't part of every story in its way, even ours. (laughs) 
Grant Faulkner is the executive director of National Novel Writing Month, or NaNoWriMo, and the co-founder of 100 Word Story. You can find him on Twitter at Grant Faulkner or on his website at grantfaulkner.com. Our third piece moves through time and place as if it's all relative. And here's a small hint, it is indeed. Anchored in detail and dialogue, it's called Ames Hill. It was written by Aaron Calabria and published in Pithead Chapel. We hope you enjoy it as much as we do. I know they've been talking to you about weeks, but I can only think in miles, since here is the same as far. Here the breeze lilts from the kipped kitchen window, the sumac tree ripples green and rust, and the sky wells its radiance down into me, alive and still bargaining for space in my skull to hold how this all goes away. Meanwhile, an echo of us keeps driving down the winter dirt of Ames Hill, you saying, be patient for now, don't do a thing with haste, and me believing because behind a windshield, everything sounds closer. Conversation and rain and songs we belted along to. Heartbreakers, guilty pleasures, made true, made ours, made indestructible in that car that never did surrender to the snow. Years later, at your wedding, after the sky went black and half of us changed into jeans, you passed around sparklers, still in your suit, lit one, and walked off alone into your parents' lawn, brightness spitting from your hand as you said, not quite to yourself, you have to find the darkest place. So I know that you know how to do this, how to step into darkness carrying light. But I don't. I just don't. I just need you to call like you used to from the road, a shimmer of pavement and leaves under towing your voice, till some ridge, some empty place, swept it crackling away from me. And I never knew if you heard when I said your name, and take care, and I love you, into that fathomless hum, which is all I know how to do, which is all I will never give up. Aaron Calabria is a co-founding editor at Empty House Press, which publishes writing about home, place, and memory. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram at Aaron underscore Calabria, or on her website at AaronCalabria.net. And that's our show. Thanks so much for stopping by. This episode was edited and curated by Dylan Evers and produced and hosted by me, Drew Hawkins. Our theme song is by Matt Ordez. Maymay Kaufman runs our social media. Find us on LitHub, our website at micropodcast.org, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to check out our interview series headed by Kirsten Renault called Five Cues with Kirsten. It's just super short chats with writers featured on the show. You'll love it. We've got a full transcript up at our website, and if you need subtitles, check out our YouTube page, which you can find links to on our website as well. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and review. It's really helpful. It helps more people find and listen to us, and we'd super appreciate it. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Podcast Micro. Thanks for listening. <laughs>